It's that time of year, time for golf's first major held on perhaps the game's most hallowed turf, the luscious green fairways of Augusta National. Senses are on a heightened alert with the azaleas and dogwoods in full bloom as Mother Nature's alarm clock tolls and the springtime air fills while whispers of the ghosts of the game's great echoes through these rolling Georgia pines. Meanwhile, in a conference room in Nashville, Tennessee, in an office in Seattle, Washington, another epic game prepares as we start episode 77 of Promoter 101. This is John Giddings, and I'm on Promoter 101. B101 in the morning, joined by your wacky morning drive team, Steiny and the Beers. Only on B101, the future of rock and roll. That's right, Connor. <laughs> it's fucking episode 77 on Promoter 101, the podcast. And Luke Pierce is back with us, and I'm Dan Steinberg. How you doing, buddy? It's great to be back, Dan. We got a great podcast ahead of us. Episode 77 rocking out this week. We're going to kick things off with Live Nation's Rich Best. Followed by UTA's Natalia Nataskin, and she's got an amazing story about how she learned the language through rock and roll. It's a pretty incredible story. Very excited for that interview. We're going to also have Festival Republic's Melvin Ben dropping in on us. It's a great interview. We want to stick around for that. And literally one of the best minds in the industry, Michael Mills, turns the tables on me. And man, he's got a great interview coming up with him in just a couple of weeks. But stoked we finally got Mike on the podcast. It's going to be great. And of course, we got the news of the week. Trevor Solomon, Crashline Productions on Promoter 101. We're finished at the moment for the Promoter 101 World Tour, but Dan's got an appearance coming up this summer. Where are you going to be in July, Dan? Heading out to Toronto for IAVM at Venue Connect 2018. It's the Promoter Agent Panel. I'm moderating. You're going to see Brian Hill up there. You're going to see Ralph James, Jason Zink, Charlie Goldstone, Riley O'Connor. It should be a good time. And people have been emailing and asking when we're going to do another live podcast. And honestly... I don't know, Luke, do you want to do more of these things? Are we going to keep them going? I think we should, Dan. I, I think it's been a great run. I'm happy, if nothing, to be out of conference season, so that we'll be back at our desk working for a bit. But I think we're going to get the itch to go on the road sooner rather than later. So let's stay tuned. I mean, we're getting the offers. There's no question. And I appreciate the people in Spain and Brisbane and everyone else like reaching out. Those places take a long time to get to and a long time to get back. So no disrespect, but it'll be a minute before we're doing anything that far out of pocket. But certainly love love the live shows, but it takes a lot out of us. Quite grueling. You're just never as productive as you are on the road, and both of us actually do have day jobs, so... <laughs> It'd be good for us to be at a desk once in a while. I did really enjoy going to the college campus last year of Berkeley in Boston. I thought that was one of the most fun things I did all last year. Super, super engaged audience there. It was great to be with Mark and Todd and everybody up there. I mean, that was just a great panel and a great time. I'd love to be doing more of that. Yeah, the colleges are cool. I'm, yeah, I'm over the conference thing for a minute. But hey, conference season's over. That's to be expected, right? Absolutely. It's time to work. With that in mind, you can always follow us on Twitter. Luke is W. Luke Pierce. I'm the Jew, and you can catch the show at Promoters 101 with the S. It's plural. Everybody drinks. <laughs> We've got an email as well. If you've got thoughts, questions, want to give us some feedback, shoot us a note to Steiny at Promoter101.net. It'll hit both Dan and I. We'd love to hear from you. 100%. Now everyone drinks. <laughs> Hello there, Andy Summers from APA and Promoter 101. Happy to be here. If you missed any of our past podcasts, well, hey, you can always catch up at Promoter101.net. This week, we've got a classic reissue of episode 35. And why is it a classic reissue? Because we put the word classic in front of reissue. <laughs> That's a, another great podcast. It's got an awesome interview from Concerts West, John Meglin, who took us through the history of the original Concerts West, as well as his past days at Pace, and talks about why he left SFX. 
Now, that was a part one, and we have been talking to John and working out the part two, and I know a lot of you have emailed us about when's it going to happen, and it's definitely going to happen. He's totally down, and he's a great storyteller. We need to get the second half of that story of the growth of Concerts West and the AEG build-out as him and Gongerware were employees one and two of that team. But the beginning of that is amazing, and you got to hear it. Also on that episode, Cindy Lynott from Works talks about winning a Grammy and selling six million records going platinum with A Great Big World. Also, comic Billy Wayne Davis talked a little bit about life on the road and opening for Sturgill Simpson. I had a dinner with Billy last year where he got so stoned because he was so nervous about who else was at the dinner that he didn't talk at all after he sat down at the table for the entire dinner. It was pretty amazing. Doug Edley was uh, who he was intimidated by, by the way. It was <laughs> – that's pretty funny that he, Luke is not he, laughing at Doug Edley. He's just laughing because Doug is the nicest guy in the business and you never have to be intimidated by him because he's just so welcoming and cool. But he's a very big agent at UTA in the comedy field. So if you're a comic and I totally screwed up, I was just like one of those dinners where I was like, hey, we're in L.A. putting some people together. And it didn't occur to me that I invited a rising comic to come have dinner with one of the biggest agents in the field. For him to be stoned and not funny was probably not a good look, though, Dan. I don't know how much you, you really helped Billy in that situation. Situation. It was just meant to catch up with him, but I didn't. he didn't talk at all. It was like, <laughs> anyway, plus Tommy Lee's manager, Rick Canny, joins us for three questions. You can check out episode 35 and all the other episodes of Promoter 101. If you subscribe to this podcast, it's a completely free service. Just click the little button, drop us a review. We'd love to hear from you. I don't know if it's a service so much as an annoyance, but hey, it's here. Do with it what you will. Hey, this is Gino Shelton, and I'm on Promoter 101. of the week. This is the first time I've ever gotten to do this line. It's time for news of the week. You know, there were a lot of people in the tech world and on Wall Street waiting to see how Spotify's much anticipated direct listing would go. The stock opened up on Tuesday midday at 165 bucks a share, valuing the company as high as $30 billion before it slid about 10% and is rebounded today in trading up to $149 a share. That's under most of the consensus targets for the street, which has about $166 per share, but there are some firms targeting this as high as 220 Dan, did you take any action on Tuesday? Have you touched it at all yet? Uh, I got fear of the stock market. I don't mess with it. I like stable things like rock and roll to invest in. <laughs> yeah, very stable, low-risk environment. I absolutely love it. I can tell you that, though, among the sellers on Tuesday was Sony Music Group that dumped about $250 million worth of shares when the stock opened up. So not a bad little payday for Sony there, but dumping 5% of the holdings out of the market is a nice little windfall for the company. Now, you should never accept investing advice from me or Luke. You should absolutely know that. But just for entertainment's sake, and we should check back in on this, but I think you're going to see this rise over time. And you got to remember, too, that this was not an initial public offering. This is a direct listing, which is a very important difference when you talk about volatility and stock price. Initial public offerings are underwritten by a bank that takes this to market. When you do it a direct listing, there's no one underwriting that stock price. So the volatility is going to be way higher, and the floor is a little lower than what you might expect for a more stable public offering. So I think as people start to cover this, as firms start to add the stock to coverage, you'll see a little stability in price. But it'll be really telling to see what the next couple quarters have been business look like for Spotify, some of their competitors and Amazon Music and Apple Music continue to stream in as part of those huge behemoth businesses. Luke Pierce, the wolf of West End. I love it. <laughs> Uh, what else we got here today, Dan? We've got a report here from our buddy Dave Brooks saying that Kaboo is launching Texas Music Festival at Jerry Jones' AT&T Stadium. It's the third Kaboo, I believe, now that is in existence. They've got, of course, Kaboo down in Del Mar in San Diego in its third or fourth year now, plus a Kaboo in the Caymans. I don't think they've yet to make dollar one on San Diego. So are these guys just looking to build a festival company to sell off to AEG or Live Nation? They're building a brand, clearly, and they're up to something, but they've yet to make dollar one from what I can tell. I'm not going to stick my head into this particular lion's mouth, but I can tell you that there is some private equity money that backs Kaboo at this point out of a holdings group in Colorado, ironically. And I believe they took a cash infusion from Virgin when Virgin came in to be their official brand partner for it. So it really is a well-organized, well-run, well-produced festival, but you can tell they spend a fuck ton of money on these things. And judging by where ticket sales are at, they'd have to be really raking in F&B and concessions and 
and sponsorship money to make up that difference between revenue and expenses that I'm sure they're putting out there produce. So it's interesting for sure, but I agree with you, Dan. I'm not sure if they're making money yet. By the way, it's all hearsay because nobody gets to actually see their books. We're all just projecting based on what the word is in the industry. And Roger's booking a great show setup, but it should be put out there that it takes a long time to build any festival. So usually the first year loses millions of dollars and the second year loses less, but still millions of dollars. And hopefully by year four or five or six, you're breaking even and starting to make some of that money back. So to say that they're not making any money yet is normal because they're fairly new what year three or four, whatever on this thing. And it's early on. So they shouldn't be making money yet on a brand that big. It costs a lot of money to underwrite this stuff. Absolutely. I'm so excited about this. So I guess he's my manager at this point, if you believe what you hear at Polestar. Irving Azoff is hosting a new Sirius XM show. Now, this is amazing. Now that he's going to be talent himself, I can't wait to hear it and check it out. This should be so cool. Yeah, really, really looking forward to Irving. He's obviously personable, opinionated. He's going to have some great guests on it. And I love the title of the show, Unmanageable. He produced things like Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Clearly, he's done some amazing things with the artists he manages. But his tweets were brilliant when he tweeted. And he kind of stopped when he got involved with the Live Nation Ticketmaster thing. Started a little bit when he exited. But he has some really remarkable, entertaining things. I'm a fan. There's some movers and shakers around the industry this week here. We've got a few things we want to talk about. First of all, in the management world, Polestar's reporting that Paul Geary and Steve Wood, formerly partners with Irving Azoff, have formed Global Artist Management with an initial client roster boasting Godsmack, Joe Perry, and co-management of the supergroup, The Hollywood Vampires. Are they co-managing that with Shep, you think? I would imagine so. Somebody over in Alive taking a look at this. With Alice's involvement in the project, Shep's got to be involved in that in some way. A second little piece here, we saw in The Hollywood Reporter yesterday that Roar founders Greg Seuss and Bernie Cahill have taken the entire music department and left to form a company backed by Jacksonville Jaguars owner Tony Cott. They'll take all the clients, including Grateful Dead, Dwight Yoakam, and Frankie Ballard to form activist artist management. Very exciting move for those guys. Ben Folds and Cake are going to mix it up together and do a co-headline tour. Looks like about 10 dates they're going to hit. Tall Heights is opening. Grand, I fucking love. And they're really coming up. They're going to hit Boston, Philly, Nashville, Milwaukee, Asbury Park. That's a great combo. Speaking of Asbury Park, there's a festival brewing, and it's booked with Jack Johnson, Incubus, Social Distortion, Ben Harper, The Innocent Criminals, Brandy Carlisle, Milky Chance, Blondie, and many, many others. This is the See Here Now lineup that we're talking about in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Dave Brooks is reporting Kanye West split with his longtime management. No one's going to be shocked that Kanye had a change in his team. Big surprise. Yeah, right. And that'll do it for the news of the week. It's a beautiful day here at Augusta. Today I had to decide between wearing a shirt with a beautiful palmetto on it or a lobster, and I chose to wear the shirt with the anchors on it instead. Ah, looking at my beautiful boat shoes and my <laughs> wide array of different colored pants and shorts to choose from. It took me an hour to get out of my closet this morning because I had the full Crayola Crayon 64 box <laughs> colors of crayons at my hands and leisure. And I went with a taupe, Luke. <laughs> Hi, I'm Holly Gleason, editor of Woman Walk the Line, here at Promoter 101, where they know how to get it done. And finally, we want to take a moment to shine a spotlight on Entourage Talent's Wayne Forte. He has helped mold this industry, making it what it is today, and making him our badass of the week. Thanks goes out to you, Wayne, for, well, giving us all a career and just being an amazing mentor and a great agent. Tedeschi Trucks, Satriani, it goes on for ages with the acts he's worked with, but really the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has kind of been what he represented over the years, everyone that's been inaugurated anyway. Congrats goes out to you, Wayne. This is Lenore Kinder. I work for AEG Presents, and you're listening to Promoter 101. Our featured interview this week is with Live Nation's Rich Best. Rich Best is in the house. Welcome, dude. Hey, man. Good to be here. Excited. I feel like I met you for the very first time on a panel that Sue McLean moderated at Polestar back in our younger days. Sue McLean, one of my original mentors in this business. That was a long time ago, brother. <laughs> Let's start with Sue. Let's take it back to Minneapolis. Early days for you. How'd you get started in the business? Honestly, failed rock star. 
You know, I was playing in bands in Minneapolis, late 80s. I had a lot of fun. Somewhere in there, I don't know, some probably at the time, some drug-induced haze to had a moment of clarity and recognize that I wasn't going to be a rock star. And kind of at the same time, a friend of mine who still does wardrobe in the business today, she was doing promotions at First Avenue. And she had an opportunity to go on the Motley Crew and Rat Tour doing wardrobe. So like Dr. Feelgood? And it's probably Dr. Feelgood, definitely. Right in that 89 time frame? Yeah, Dr. Feelgood, Girls, 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 somewhere in there. Yeah, somewhere so in there. mid to late 80s. Exactly. Doc yeah. McGee management. Days. Exactly. Yep, exactly. So she recommended me to Steve McClellan, another one of my original mentors from First Avenue. Said, I think he'd be great, knows music, loves music. I met with him and uh, he hired me on the spot. And I, I started my career literally in a closet size office with a copy machine, a desk, and a phone. And I started making copies, delivering them to record stores. There's no ticketing system, that's for sure. There's no ticket. Master or access. It was uh, calling quick, the record stores. That's right, quick ticks. So we do, yeah, quick ticks. We'd order the tickets, and I'd bring them to the record stores with flyers. And from there, I just you know started advising on local bands, and kind of had some opportunities to start doing some booking in the small room, the Seventh Street entry. Saw that I was passionate about music, and literally didn't leave the club. So I was always a good sounding board. And he'd ask me about you know I'm in the record stores, who's buying records, and just give him advice on who to book into the main room. And with that, develop that close connection with him and he eventually started letting me do some of the booking there and, and then eventually kind of took it over and, and at that time it's probably early 90s some of the big things in Seattle started to happen and, and I was very fortunate to have some early relationships with some of those bands coming out of there and that's kind of where my career started John Silva and Mark Geiger and Don Muller those guys have been with you like since the early days right? In the early days absolutely I mean Don Muller is one of the f- first kind of real major super agents to really give me that opportunity, even just as a a club buyer. Obviously, very hands-on, still is to this day. I've talked to him three times today. He was that first real big agent to really say, you're my guy. You kind of need that, right? You need the guy on the next level to like grab you and say, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Don't fuck up. 100%. You know, I've been very fortunate to have, first of all, some unbelievable mentors in my career. But in addition to that, some relationships on the outside with agents and managers where sort of that trust was developed. And Don was right at the top of that list of one of my guys early, early on. You've always kind of centered around the cooler acts. You can look at anybody's roster and tell who does what, but the mainstream cool stuff that sells records at rock have been the core of what you do. Marty Diamond's act, Don Muller's, like the really hip, cool, big arena rock stuff has become your day to day. But those relationships when those acts were club acts, you've built up with them. Yeah, I mean, and, and Marty's certainly another one of those guys. I was just talking the other day. The first show I booked with Coldplay was at the 400 Bar in Minneapolis. And obviously, as a company, we have a much different relationship with the act now. But that, for me, was a great example of growing with a band ground up. And it's still a part of my life and my job that I love to this day. You know, candidly, I don't get to do a lot of club buying and and really growing where they act from the ground up. Well, your expertise is understanding the arena deals. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's sort of evolved into that, but I try to stay close to it. You know, I mean, we have a great team in our local office, Brian Smith, Greg Siegel. Those guys do an unbelievable job of, you know, I guess keeping me relevant and and what's important today. Well, yeah, but I got to imagine that even if you got the avail for Greta Van Fleet, it doesn't necessarily make sense for having 17 buyers in Los Angeles at Live Nation all having the relationship with each venue on Sunset. It just probably doesn't make sense. You got to streamline that. Exactly. You guys don't need nine people talking to Staples. Oh, exactly. You wind up holding three holds behind other Live Nation holds and you can't find out who's in front of you. There's a lot of that. That's for sure. It's an interesting thing when you start doing more volume and you realize that your hold's blocking your other hold. I know. I look at our calendars at the Wiltern and Palladium and even our amphitheaters. I mean, this time of year, I mean, they're eight holds deep. You know, it's crazy. You moved to LA and went from a very strong market. Minneapolis is one of the strongest rock markets in the world, without question. 
But you moved from what number ten market in the country to the number two market in the country, something like that. Yeah, I, I forget. I moved here in two thousand and five, and that's after Sue and I were together. We had a great run at Compass. She branched off and started doing her own thing, and I spent uh, a couple great years working for Rick Franks and Mark Campana in Minneapolis, and we had a lot of success. It really took off then, and that got the attention of some people out here and. I I remember like yesterday, I got a call from Mark Campana and he said, you're going to get a call in 10 minutes and it's going to be from Charlie Walker. And they're going to ask you if you want to come to LA and be a part of the Los Angeles booking team and kind of beef up the presence and, you know, start doing what you do out there. So this is before Charlie left originally when he had Michael's job. That's right. Yep. That's right. So he said, I want you to call home right now, find out if this is even an option. And I did that. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, I got the call from Charlie Walker and I was on a plane the next week. I came out and met with an, another one of my mentors, Brian Murphy. Avalon. Avalon. That's right. Was he at Clear Channel or SFX or Live Nation, whatever the company was at that moment? He was. Absolutely. Yeah, he was. Because Avalon was gobbled up by SFX, right? Yep. So he was one, I think they were, I don't know, three or four in line in the acquisitions. I forget where, but they were one of the original acquisitions. A yeah, a big one. Yep. Because they owned LA and a good part of San Diego. That's right. You know, so I met with Brian and it was kind of a perfect fit. It presented a challenge that I couldn't pass up. I mean, to do it in our arguably one of the biggest entertainment markets in the world. That for me was a no-brainer. Now, how much of a challenge is that, like picking up from one market where you have all these relationships and moving to another where there might have been other relationships? Because you're talking about buying against Paul Tillette. And at that point, probably Rick too is, I imagine, still alive or just passed? Just did passed. You're talking about some serious history with those guys standing up to walking into a market where these guys have always sold you the show, but now you're competing with guys that built the axe in this market. That had to be a whole new challenge. Honestly, it was challenging, humbling. You know, when you go from a market market like Minneapolis, where you've you started your career, you developed all your relationships, you grew, you're the guy. And in Minneapolis, I was one of the guys. And when I got to LA, I wasn't one of the guys. And a lot of those relationships that I had grown, they had their LA relationships. And it took me probably 18 months from first getting to LA to really sort of have my bearings, you know? I remember telling Murph when I got here, I was just like, man, it's just, it's not happening like I want it to. Were you second guessing yourself a little bit on that move in the first 18 months? Uh, the weather was pretty good, so I wasn't quite second myself. <laughs> second <laughs> guessing myself. The yeah. Sunshine. <laughs> yeah, but it was humbling. So it was actually a Judas Priest show that I did in, at Long Beach Arena. That was my first arena show that I, I did in LA. Had a semi exclusive there. You know, it had probably a three or four year run there where it was a great alternative to playing Staples Center. The form at the time wasn't back online. And that venue actually kind of helped me get going. So the importance of venue relationships are very key to this day. So you are in LA, but you oversee more than just Los Angeles. You've got a bigger vision than just one market. What's your territory, so to speak? I've worn a few different hats. At one point, it was Central California, LA, San Diego, Las Vegas. Candidly, it was, it was too much. Well, Vegas should be a full-time job for one person. hundred percent. We definitely, when we took the market over, we, had, we definitely grew the presence there. But that landscape just was changing dramatically. I mean, you really need, to your point, Dan, and you needed that boots on the ground there. And we weren't it. And San Diego, you know, itself too, to really dive into that market and grow it, you needed a full-time presence here. And at the same time, the competitive landscape in LA was continuing to evolve rapidly. It was just too much. So what we did was several business units around the um, states, you know, definitely kind of broke off and San Diego and Las Vegas were two of uh, of the markets that we we did break off. So right, right so now- Candace picked up San Diego. Candace picked up San Diego. So who has Orange County? We have Orange County. Okay, so that's right in the middle there. Exactly. So I'm basically Fresno, Central Coast, Central California, down through Orange County. Fres no. Fres, yes. That's eh, where grapes go to die. <laughs> I have spent my time at the William Saroyan. I, ah. I know the market well, but <laughs> you don't hit points in Fresno that often. Not often. Not often. It's one of those markets you send the reduction letter before the offer goes in. <laughs> it's a long drive home from Fresno when yes, you lost 20 grand. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but hey, there's a lot of markets like that. I mean, Bankersfield's a tough market too. If you hit it right, absolutely awesome. But it is a tough market to sell tickets in. Man, I'll, I'll tell you. And look, I mean, those are two markets that have taken a bit to recover. They're starting to rebound now, 
But again, you have in a 90 mile area, there's three arenas, you know, Rabobank Arena, Save Mart and Selland downtown. I mean, that's a lot of arenas in a 90 mile area in Central California. So you definitely can't play both. That's for sure. And then you've got things like San Luis Obispo that are doing more shows on mm-hmm. campus. And sure. Santa Barbara seems to be pretending they're an A market with trying to go after a lot of those bigger acts between the bull and the theaters. It's a weird thing when you're seeing a lot of these tertiaries and secondaries try to step up because they do one or two massive shows in a year and people aren't used to not having to drive. So everybody comes and that makes people excited. That they made money. So they start doing more shows and it doesn't become that exciting and it kills the volume. Yep. You're a hundred percent right. The market can't support it, but we all get greedy and we're like, Ooh, if we could sell one, maybe we can sell two. If we can sell two, maybe we can sell six. <laughs> Man, I'll, I'll tell you, I, hey, I've had that couple instances in Fresno where we just cranked it out of the park on Drake, sold out on the on sale. I mean, crushed. And I went, all in on hip hop. I bought every, (laughs) everything. You would have thought that I I had some sort of like favored nations deal on hip hop. I was buying so much there and it didn't all pan out. Let's talk about being at Live Nation. You now aren't buying for an indie, which you've had that experience. You're buying for the biggest promoter in the world. Do people treat you differently because you have some serious money behind you? Do you pay more for acts than maybe I would because of who you are? In the last few years, I've seen a bit of a shift. Do we write big checks as a company? Really big ones. You know, do I write big checks locally? Yes, absolutely. What I don't hear as much of is the, well, you're Live Nation or we can grind you because you're Live Nation. That was really prevalent. Early would agents on. literally say that to you? Oh, yeah. Or they would just have oh, that yeah. attitude? No, it was an attitude, but you would hear it too. It would come up in a negotiation. You know, what is it to you? And that to me, you know, when you played with your own money, you know better than anyone. When you're playing with your own money, and I have, and I've also done it with smaller companies where it was an impact if you were wrong. And that's something to me that I keep with me to this day. I try to go into everything as though I'm playing with my own money. But not to mention, too, we're a big company, but everybody's got a bottom line. And we have a bottom line. We have a bottom line as a company, and I have a bottom line locally that I'm responsible to. And that's something I take very seriously. But I also resent when there's that mentality that somebody says, well, it's not your money. And you hear that from time to time. Again, you used to hear it more. It's not your money. Yeah, but you've got to answer for your numbers. Fuck yeah, I do. Absolutely. And trust me, I've had to answer for them when they're great and you're crushing your budgets and all that. And I've had to be there front and center and be accountable for when they're not. And I try not to ride the highs too high. And, you know, when I lose money today on a show and I'm wrong on a bet, it impacts me to the core. I feel it as much today as I did when I was an independent. I can say that with a straight face. When I was younger and I used to visit LA, I used to feel for Rick and Paul because agents were at every show. This was the market. Even if the agents were in New York or Nashville, they flew in for the LA show. The press is here. It's a big show. People are always here for those shows. The record people, the publicist, the manager. There is never an LA show where you don't have everybody coming in, even if they live in here, whatever. They're all here. So that means you have to be at basically every show or making an appearance because you know there's people there. You have to be out more. That wasn't a problem in Minneapolis. I'm sure you've gotten used to it, but there's more pressure if you fuck up, if they're unhappy with the number of towels or how much beer they got. You don't get an email later or have a chance to fix it. The manager is the one telling you. Does that change the game level? Oh, completely. And and honestly, that was a huge transition for me. You would be lucky if a few times a year in Minneapolis, if an agent or manager would come in for a show. They had to like really want that Juicy Lucy. Something. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, man. I was just talking about Juicy Lucy the other day. Want a burger. I got to go cover a show in Minneapolis so I can get some mats. Totally. But here, every single aspect of it. I mean, on any given night, not only do you have the responsible agent there, you have half the agency there. You have the manager there. You have the label. There. I mean, everybody is there. And look, could you fuck up in Minneapolis? Could you take a night off from not covering every single show? Sure. I'm, I'm a show guy. So I mean, I, well, I had to be because I, I did everything. But you know, there, I, I didn't take many nights off there. To this day, if I'm not at a show, you hear about, it. oh, taking the night off, I see, huh? Couldn't make it, huh? Bet you were at so-and-so show last night. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's all in good it never fun. Never stops, though. Never yeah. stops. 
But even things like here, like ad mats or radio spots or blah, 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 you can't get it wrong here. Right. And you still have to run print here, right? Because there's an ego about LA. Yeah, less and less. But yeah. But, well, but more here well, than anywhere else. Oh, by far. I mean, even in New York, they don't make you run print anymore. I'll tell you what. We ran print here way longer than anywhere else because of the industry ego factor. Let's talk about the other side of that. People would say because you're Live Nation, you have this global touring division that buys tours and you're automatically handed all of these tours to put into the arenas and you have all these cool big shows. But it's not just that. You have to deal with fighting for the other shows that aren't part of tour deals. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we work very closely with our global and national touring divisions. Our business unit alone, our, our market that uh, we're responsible for, I mean, we'll book oh, probably this year. I think we land the plane around 450 shows. And trust me, our touring division isn't delivering, you know, 450 shows to the market. So there is absolutely an expectation that we are buying and buying aggressively on a local level. But to your point, too, is we're definitely through all aspects, you know, trying to go from the ground up. So the Wilter and the Palladium, I mean, if it's 500 seats with, with the right act, we're doing it. Very, very involved in buying very aggressively on a local level. Did it ever work out where you think that a tour is going to go to global and there's a global offer in and you guys back off and try and aggressively buy the market as a one-off and then it goes the other way where they sell to everybody and you didn't have your offer in? Early on, as that division grow, I think maybe there was some tensions between the local office and the national office. Not now. I mean, it is such a well-oiled machine and they'd feed just an unbelievable amount of content to the local offices. And the buying portion of it is one aspect. I mean, I was mentored by concert promoters. You're a concert promoter, and that is very different than talent buying. In my opinion, they're, they're, those are two different things. The concert promoter part of my job, whether it's bought nationally or it's bought locally, doesn't go away. I still do and take the same mindset I do into everything that I'm involved in. What would have Minnesota Rich said to L.A. Rich when he called music shows content? <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> that was good, Dan. Sorry. Well played. No, well played. <laughs> would uh, not have thought that, that that word would have ever come out of your mouth. Yeah, no music. kidding. I know you no love it, No kidding. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, maybe my business acumen. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, but I had to do it. <laughs> that was good. That was good. He would have been proud. <laughs> He's really grown up. When you were playing the rock star in Minneapolis, what was your role? Were you the singer? I was. I was. How long did that work? Did you have a couple albums, some touring? Yeah, or how you know, I mean, we were in the studio a bunch. We did some, you know, regional touring. Got, you know, when so you a truly times. understand the experience of what goes into breaking an act from the inside. Oh, yeah. And again, I mean, when you spend, you know, nine years at, at First Avenue, I mean, every day, seven days a week, pretty much. And you could see it. You could see acts growing from the ground up. And, you know, you could see the ones that made the mistakes that skipped steps and and you saw them on the way back down. Hey, man, everybody can't turn out to be Ugly Kid Joe. <laughs> it's a damn shame. But look, I mean, we, we, had a, we had a pretty good local draw, but you might be big in Minneapolis. So that doesn't mean you're big in Chicago. There's a lot of talent buyers that are coming up, and it's a different genre than when you and me were buying. We lived through watching SFX gobble up all of the promoters and the major promoters going away and new positions opening up. But the younger buyers are in a different world than you and me ever were. That's a different level of understanding the business for the most part. Looking back, if you were just starting out now, what would you currently say to you to try and save you some heartache? It goes back to what I was saying about there's differences between being a talent buyer and a promoter. Be a promoter. You're talking about acting as if it's your own money, always. Exactly. Exactly. The relationship today, if I see young buyers make mistakes, they're forgetting about the relationship and really nurturing that relationship, being unique at your gig. Develop that personality, that persona that, that identifies you so people remember you. Your job doesn't stop once you buy the show. And that's the piece that I hope I get right. If I, you know, I, I don't know who would call me their mentor. Maybe there's a few out there that might today, but that's the piece that is most important, you know, is taking that ownership all the way through the end of the show, through settlement and any follow up you might have after the show. I hope we start churning out more true promoters and less just talent buyers. Before I let you go, one last question. And this is just for my own personal like interest. If you could put 
any one act back together with living members, who would you reunite? And they can't, they, uh, they gotta be alive. They I mean, they, they gotta they don't be alive. Have, okay. I mean, it could be like the Eagles where it's enough of them are alive. They could tour. Mm-hmm. It, had you asked me that six months ago, it absolutely would have been who's could do. That was one for me that I was hoping to see one more time. Rich Bass joining us in Promoter 101. Thank you so much, man. Awesome. Thanks. Really appreciate it. I don't think there's a top 10 list of buyers anywhere in the world where Rich isn't on it. Truly one of the best. No fucking pun intended. By the way, I don't know who makes these lists if they even exist. But if there was a top 10 list, that fucker would be on it. This is Jason Flom, chairman and CEO and founder of Lava Records on Promoter 101. Tweet. 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 Of the week. Time to dive into the sick and twisted mind of Dan Steinberg with some Promoter 101 tweets of the week. I'm not all that sick and twisted. I would say you're like one in four is sick and twisted, but you know, it really does stand out. I'm somebody's dad, Luke. <laughs> Let's start with this one. When you're in settlement during your favorite song, hashtag promoter 101, what the, what is this? WTF. What the fuck? 101. What- is this a new thing? It's a new thing. Okay. Promoter 101, what the fuck? I like it. Uh, when was this happening, Dan? Yeah, last week I was in Sacramento and Murder in the City, Avet Brothers. Dude, it just what kills the- me. They, they played Murder in the City in Sac, though? They did. And it was like, oh, uh, and you it. know what was worse? Dane Honeycutt, the road manager, gave me the set list so I would know when they were doing it. I got the show settled early. It was sold out, handed over the paperwork, and got caught talking to some people backstage and fucking missed it. Man. Yeah. That is a bummer. They don't always play that song, which is especially bigger sting. How about this one? When an agent asks you what date you challenged and cleared, as if we have not plotted this routing like our life depended on it. Hashtag promoter 10 WTF. Yeah, this one just takes the winds out of your sails, man. Holy shit. I hate that. But all is good. I think we're going to be able to keep the dates in, even though the agent wasn't keeping his eyes on what we were challenging. How about when everyone that you text, email, and Slack responds with emojis? Use your words. You're big boys and girls. Use your words. Those are words, Dan. That's a form of communication. Come on now. Do you see me rolling my eyes at you, motherfucker? No, but you could send me the rolling eye emoji and I might understand what you're doing. That'll do it for Promoter 101 Tweets of the Week. Make sure you follow Dan on Twitter. He is at the Jew. Hi, this is Jake Sovnarowski from Rocks Off, New York City's sweetest independent concert promoter, and you're listening to Promoter 101. Next up, we're joined by who I'm going to say is about to be an icon. If you don't know him yet, you certainly should. Mike Mills has been producing some of the coolest shows on the road, and he's now about to turn the tables with us. Welcome, Mike Mills. What do you got for me? Well, as a fan of the podcast, I've heard you refer to this as a love letter to the industry. I'm wondering, though, beyond that, when you sit down and you think about each episode in the collective, is there like an organizing principle or a theme or some heart that you use to guide your questions and something you're trying to drill down to? It's actually a really interesting question because there are many different styles of interviews and it changes up depending on who it is. Like the Michael Rapino interview was very scripted, almost like an NFL coach. I had a play sheet and I was choosing what I was going to ask and where I was going. And my Michael was watching me cross things off. He saw me going through the cheat and he was paying attention to that. Based on his answers and how much time we had, I was skipping through things and there was like first tier questions and second tier questions. And okay, that was a little harsher than I thought it was going to be. So I'm going to ask something a little later now and calm it down and kind of bring it off. So that was very, very scripted. And I had lots of different options for that live moment in that stage, in that moment. In other scenarios where it's someone like you in particular, who I know, and we have a long relationship and we're friends, it's a little bit more off the cuff. And I know your business and I have some curiosities and let's have a conversation about, you know, the whole ethos of Mills Entertainment. And then there's just a hybrid of depending on who it is and how their business relates to me, how well I know them. There's a couple of agents that I've interviewed in the last couple of days that I didn't know at all. And it was really an interesting way to get to know them. So in some scenarios, you don't want to go in going, okay, so what do you do in the business? You want to know something. It's not interesting at all. But there's a little bit of that, oh, okay, so this guy has these three bands that are just blowing up right now. That's a fun case study. This guy does this really interesting thing that nobody talks about, but it's super cool. Somebody's a photographer on the side that really successful like China Schwan is. It's just like, that's an interesting hobby that she's done really, really well with. 
So I, I try to weigh those things and figure out what people might find as fascinating because I do. And then we go back at the end and find out because some of the questions are like really flat. It's like, hey, that's amazing. And they're like, yeah, it's not. You know, it's like, okay, well, that's probably not going to make the air. Or this question I asked somebody and they like really, really overwhelmingly surprised me. It's like, okay, that's, that's going to be something we really kind of focus on. And at the same time, when we edit, we're not trying to change the vibe of the answer. We're trying to clean it up and shorten it up. So sometimes we'll pull questions that just don't really fit, had no real meaning to the response. It's like, hey, how about this? It's just like, yeah. And you're just like, oh, well, I learned nothing from that. It's like, okay, cool. Or if we've got a, an hour and a half interview that maybe we laid down, you know, we're only going to air 40 minutes of it. It's like, what part was interesting and what part was like somebody read a bedtime story to their child and they basically did the whole giving tree verbatim. It's like, we're probably not going to air that part of it. Oh, that's a great story. Appreciate it. Mike is a true one day king in this industry. Full interview with him coming up on one of the podcasts in the next couple of weeks. Hey, it's Brian Penix with NS2 and ABI Management. I'm going to be on Promoter 101. We're joined by Festival Republic's Melvin Ben. Melvin Ben, legendary in the festival space. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Very well. Overlooking Hyde Park here in London on the bit of sunshine, a rare occasion here. Throughout Europe, you have a legendary name in the space. How did you get your start? I started in politics, through politics, really. The first outdoor event I ever did was on a, you know, articulated lorry trailer, which was the stage, and I parked that up in Battersea, and I got a friend of mine who was living in a squat that I'd set up, and he came and played, and it was September 1979, and I was trying to get the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, out of office. <laughs> Did not see that coming. <laughs> and it, I succeeded, actually, because 11 years later, she was gone. <laughs> and you stayed the course. I stayed the course. Indeed, I did. And without that, she could still be here. God, that would, that would be awful. <laughs> for not for that trailer. Indeed. <laughs> Uh, my entire early period was sort of political activism, really. And, you know, used to put big outdoor events on to raise profile of a cause. And then how did that lead to music? Well, that was music, effectively. I, what I was doing was putting bands on to get people to come to watch the bands. And when they were coming to watch the bands, I would tell them about the cause that I had a particular beef about. And that would have been anti-apartheid or CND or, you know, some other cause that... Uh, Spoonful you know, of sugar. Yeah, that sort of stuff, really. You know, and I would... Could be any number of causes I'd be happy to jump on any course that was around at the time, really. That's amazing. What acts did that lead to for you? All sorts of acts, you know, the Pogues, you know, Billy Bragg, all that sort of stuff. It was all, all British stuff at the time, really, and uh, British and Irish stuff. Gosh, I would have been uh, inappropriate to call the Pogues British. It was a time of sort of fairly significant political sort of awareness and activism in the late 70s and 80s, and that's what I was doing, really. And I was working full-time at the time for the BBC. I was designing television lighting and things like that, and that was never too strenuous of a, a job, so I always had plenty of time on my hands to work with other bands, really. Production by day, politics by night. Indeed, yeah. So, we, you know, I did that, and then I created a company that retailed beer at festivals so that the money that I made out of that I could then put in to put in bands on and things like I that. I hear there's good money in beer at festivals. Well, you know, there's not bad money. That's certainly true. And, um, you know, one of the few things that you can be relied upon as a festival attendee is that you're going to need a pint. <laughs> so, yeah, it's worth doing. Okay, and that led to more and more volume. It led to more and more volume, but it was all free festivals. That's really what I did. I mean, throughout the 70s, mid to late 70s, it was concerts and things like that in venues. And then throughout the 80s, it was free festivals, uh, you know, to raise awareness around political causes. And I started the beer thing to retail beer, and I was retailing the beer at Glastonbury Festival. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was not too bad. So you had the entire festival, four days of people drinking beer for, what, 90,000 people? It wasn't quite as many as 90,000. Well, it wasn't 90,000 that paid in them days. There was a lot of people who used to come for free. So it probably was 90,000. So yes, I had that contract. You don't still do it, do you? No, uh, I don't still do it. But the company that I set up still does uh, retail at, at a good number of my festivals for certain. That one by itself could be a career within itself. <laughs> it's now, what, 175,000 people that go to Glastonbury? It is indeed, yeah. Yes, it is. And they do Reading and Leeds and Latitude and Wireless and all the, you know, they do lots of my shows. And that company... 
company actually is still to this day a company that uh, the principal aim of it is to raise money to fund political campaigns. So at the heart of everything, your still core belief is the politics and getting the cause out. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of hard to reconcile in a way, but you know, I'm in a relatively commercial capitalist structure. Right, I mean, you work with Live Nation, right? Yeah, at my heart, I'm, I'm a socialist, really. I know that's a terrible term in America, but anyway, no, here in Europe, we're really quite comfortable about it. How does that reconcile with the Live Nation model? I don't think it's a bad thing at all, actually. I think the great thing about the Live Nation model is that, you know, Michael is a passionate guy and he's a passionate guy about all things in his company. And one of the things that he's passionate about is people are empowered to do the right thing that they see and deliver for the company. And so actually, I think it works really well. I'm dedicated to making money. You know, I mean, I was always even with the beer company, I was dedicated to making money. But in them days, I was dedicated to making it and then giving it away. And now I make it for Live Nation. So what caused the swing to wind up being a profit center instead of a charity, so to speak? Well, I guess a bit of age and maturity and needing to put bread on the table, really, uh, was one of the things. But the real change was that Reading Festival went bankrupt in 1988. In them days, there was actually only two festivals in the UK, which was Reading Festival and Glastonbury. And Glastonbury at that point, sent me in the early 80s, you know, I think the official capacity of Glastonbury was probably 20,000 people. Yes. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I Reading, don't think they stuck to it. Reading, <laughs> Reading was not dissimilar, small amount of people. And nobody was interested in festivals. Nobody at all was interested in festivals. And the people that owned it, you know, went around all the major music promoters and said, do you want to come in with 50% of the festival? And every single one of them turned down until they came to see, you know, my old partner and myself. And we were like, yeah, you know, I had my first visit to Reading Festival was in 1972 as a punter, without a tent, without any luggage, without any change of clothes, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And uh, I then became a fairly regular goer to Reading Festival. You in really the rocked it that first year, huh? And many years after, actually. That's hardcore. Well, I mean, I was 16. I didn't know what hardcore or softcore was. I, I just knew that I wanted to watch the bands, really. That's all I knew. And, you know, there was always a tent you could find to sleep in. Or, in fact, I used to sleep under the main stage, would you believe? Oh, that's pretty cool. I used to buy a strip of plastic and roll myself up in the strip of plastic to keep dry. <laughs> It's absolutely true. And, and I, Melvin, I fucking love you. This is great. It is absolutely true. I can just visualize it. It's awesome. Under the- there, and one of the great things is, you know, that there is nothing that any of the little buggers at Reading Festival get up to that I didn't get up to myself. And so I love it. It's a ball. It's one of the most amazing things, you know, like the most exciting place to be. If you only have five or six hours left in your life, what I would suggest you do is you prearrange those five or six hours to be in the Reading Festival campsite on the Thursday night before the music starts. It is the most exciting place in the world because there's 100,000 teenagers pushing me to the limit of what is allowed and what isn't allowed and having a ball and self-entertaining in a way that would make their mums and dads a little nervous. But believe me, they have fun. And it is just so exciting. Sounds like a lot of good, clean fun. Um, It's certainly a lot of good fun. (laughs) (laughs) And I use my words carefully. Yeah, I I got that. (laughs) So it's one of the most legendary festivals in the world. And there's no question when we talk about the things that America stole from England, rock and roll and the festival system, We've certainly bastardized it in the States, but we definitely got it from you guys. Oh, yeah. There's no question. And and actually... Um, and I think Paul Tillett would be the first person to admit that you guys were the model. Well, we probably were. And, and in fairness now, Paul certainly leads the way on a number of things. There's no question he does. And, um, you know, I was at Panorama last year and I saw the amazing screens he'd got at Panorama. And I thought, bugger this, I want them as well, really. So <laughs> so we... we You're going to steal we, it back? We're going to steal some things back as well, really. So, so and, and, you know... Well, it's a collaboration. <laughs> It's all fun. <laughs> um, Lollapalooza came from Reading Festival. Perry Farrell played Reading Festival. I can't remember what year. I think it was 94, actually. I can't remember the year off the top of my head. Loved it. Just walked away and said, I want one of them. Um, and, <laughs> and he's very open about it. And it was like, I played Reading Festival. I wanted to create my own festival. And I created Lollapalooza. And it was based on Reading Festival. Did he send you a commission check for that? No, but I'm still waiting. I'm, I, I haven't <laughs> given up hope. I'm sure it's coming. It's, I'm sure it's coming. It's international too. mail. It could take a minute. <laughs> of course, it, it, in that I'm now a partner at Lollapalooza Berlin, I guess I've got my commission now. Well, that's not a bad thing with the Charlies. They are adorable people. I'm uh, actually really, really fond of them. Big 
get on well. Now, how did that come to be, that partnership? Well, I'd met the Charlies maybe a hundred years ago or so. and They uh, look good for their age. They look good for their age. And they came to Leeds Festival. I think when they were just thinking of getting Lola, you know, reinvigorating Lola, and they came to Leeds Festival, they stayed with me for the weekend at Leeds Festival, and they put the bar profit up well, actually. The profit from the bars when they came was fantastic, and they consumed, uh, and they had a great time, and we had a great weekend, and we became friends from that point onwards, and genuine friends now. And out of that wound up eventually coming Berlin. That's one of the things that came out of it, yeah. Now, when you guys program Lollapalooza... Are you particularly making sure that that's tailored to the local market's taste? Oh, very much so, yeah. I mean, and, and I'm only involved in the Berlin show in terms of Lollapalooza. And so, you know, I have booking calls with Houston Powell and Charles Atal and Stefan Lemkul, you know, my partner in Berlin and the three or four of us. And we just talk about Berlin, that's all we do. The local scene and your guys' understanding of that market's got to play a huge part. Oh, a huge part. And actually... The, they know, can't know that very no, well no, from, they from Austin. Of course. So they, they don't, of course. And the reality is... That the German music is fantastic and is really important to Lollapalooza Berlin. It's not dominated by American and British acts. There's a fairly reasonably even balance between American and British and German acts. Will you guys be announcing Hasselhoff soon? Um, I don't know. I think we're probably looking for the Baywatch Lollapalooza in California before we do that one. I don't know that it would sell nearly as well. <laughs> He does remain as a icon for the German market, but I doubt that we'll be putting him on. Maybe a Kraftwerks? Uh, well, Kraftwerk are headlining this year, actually. So, yeah, they're very much on, on our agenda. And yet you're still keeping the theme of Palooza, so some of those bigger rock acts. Very much so. The rock acts continue to be important to it. But ultimately, we have to respond to what the local demand is. And Kraftwerk and The Weekend, for instance, are our two headliners this year. Pretty good show. Yeah, not too bad, actually. How big is that site? We've had a sort of tricky situation in Berlin in that the first site we had, which was in 2015, was the old Tempelhof Airport, which was taken over by the Americans after the Second World War. It was in West Berlin, and it was decommissioned, I think, in the late 80s. And so it was sort of stood idle. Actually, early 90s, it was decommissioned. Amazing, because there's still the American Air Force basketball courts up in there and all that sort of stuff, but huge space. And uh, that was our first location. That was 50,000 people. We had a great year there. And the Berlin authorities moved us out of there because they wanted the, the airport still in existence, not being used. But they housed a lot of Syrian refugees, um, you know, that came out of Syria uh, in the airport. So we lost our site. So then we moved to a beautiful place uh, for a one-off uh, in Treptower Park, which is close to the Russian embassy, which didn't go down too well. Um, <laughs> the Russians didn't want you to rock it, huh? They didn't want us rocking, and believe me, they lobbied against us. But we had a fantastic show there. That went to 70,000. We then went to a place uh, on the edge of Berlin, a race course there. That uh, We did 85,000, and now we've moved back to the Olympic Stadium in Berlin, and that's, uh, that's 95,000 capacity. So we're pretty happy with where we're going. 95,000 people. That is just a massive amount of people to be responsible for and to chaperone. Well, the good thing is that they don't camp. So we've only got to look after them till about 11, 11.30 at night. At Reading, it's 100,000 people all under the age of 20, and they all camp. And that's a bit more of a challenge. It's great fun, though. It's a massive organization to be able to put all of that infrastructure in place. Yeah, I mean, it is. But, you know, this is what we do. I mean, Reading and Leeds happen at the same time. They're the same festival, the same festival weekend. And they swap the headliners. And the right? headliners swap. And there's a whole organization in Reading and a whole organization in Leeds. And the bands flip between the two. And The genius of being able to book the headliners and have them here for both simultaneously. That's, it's It's great. It's really added to the... Well, I mean, for the bands, of course, it adds to their income possibility in really short space of Probably time. Probably makes it easier to book, too, since you get to send both offers together. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, you've got to produce two huge festivals simultaneously. Yeah, that's not too difficult, actually. You'd be surprised. Really? That, yeah, it's not too difficult at all. <laughs> like how comfortable you are with that. Yeah, no, it's just uh, literally it's really not too difficult. I mean, I've got a great team, obviously. I've got two great teams. I flip up and down between the two of them in, in, in a helicopter just to sort of keep an eye on both in a how way. How long is that really. for you? In the helicopter, it's about an hour and a quarter, not too long. Not bad. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, the UK is so small compared to America, it's not true, really. So within the UK, that's a decent distance. So you're selling almost 200,000 tickets that weekend for festival goers. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's incredible business. 
It's not bad. Yeah, no, it's it's good business. Yeah, I mean, but there are other weekends. The Latitude Weekend. Latitude is a festival I've got in the East Coast of England. That weekend, I've got Latitude in England. Longitude in Ireland and Benicassim Festival in Spain. You're fearing the bands back and forth between. No, we t- we th- those bands don't really sort of cross over that much. They're three quite separate festivals, but they're on the same weekend, so we seem to be stuck with that weekend. The festival business seems like it's never been stronger. Is that the case? It is the case. It's absolutely the case. Yeah. And, you know, I would say in 1989 in the UK, there were less than 30,000 people attending festivals in their entirety. And there was the, only the two festivals. Which and now you can do that in a weekend. Multiple times in a weekend. So to bring this full circle, now that you've built this massive machine with a crazy number of people coming to your festivals, are you still using that machine to get your message out? No, actually, interestingly enough, I don't. You know, I'm still active in politics, but I took a decision very keenly to... Once it was a commercial festival that I wanted people to come to party uh, and to come and get away. They were giving me giving me their money and I didn't want to force, a, you know, when they were giving me their money, I didn't want to force a message down their throat. And I think it comes through all that I do is, you know, what, what I think everybody's beliefs always come through what they do. But I don't actually put politics at the festivals at all. There must have been a hard decision for you, seeing that that was the base of everything. No, I mean, I'm, I'm very straightforward about I have politics at my core. But I don't expect everybody to have politics at their core. Thank you so much, Melvin, for taking the time and talking to me. My pleasure. Uh, Melvin was so amazing. Such the real deal and such a great guy. He just made me smile throughout the course of this entire interview. There's also a story or two that didn't make the cut because, well, I didn't want some people pissed at me. He's got some great stories. He's a truly great hang. What a good guy. Mike Luba, Madison S. Presents, Promoter 101. Got some birthdays, April 6th the 12th. Friday the 6th, Lori Jacob. On Saturday the 7th, wishing a happy birthday to Gene Stout and Seth Mulaski. Hey, on Sunday, Bob Rupp, Brian Snipe, Sylvia Lund, Kevin Castro, Cassie Zabok. On Monday, wishing a happy birthday to Brian O'Boyle and Mike Leahy. Tuesday, 410, Kevin Stone, the heart of Florida. Wednesday, Larry Murray. And finishing off the week on Thursday the 12th, Live Nation Stacy George, Arizona's Reed Glick, Straight No Chasers, Charlie Mecklin, and Everclear's Art Alexakis. Happy birthday to everybody from the gang at Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Hello, this is Dan Berkowitz from CID Entertainment and CID Presents, and I am here on Promoter 101. We've got a bonus interview for you this week. We're joined next by one of the great minds and leaders of our industry, UTA's Natalia Nataskin. Excited to have Natalia in the room. You are one of those people that comes to an agency and really just takes control and brings it together. You transform the agency group and now you're at UTA. It's an honor for me to be in that world, first of all. I mean, sometimes we lay plans and as they say, the best laid plans sometimes are not things that come true and other things that actually happen that you could have never planned for come true and happen and take your career or sometimes your personal life in so many different paths than you could have ever imagined. And so for me, really ending up on the live side was not something that I had planned for at all. I mean, I was an artist representative. I was an attorney. Oh, you passed the bar. Passed the bar. Yeah. But I really did mostly artist representation as it pertained to record deals, publishing deals, licenses, and things like that in the mid nineties in New York. And so when I started feeling the effects of Napster on my business is when I was sitting down to lunch with Steve Martin. And I was like, Steve, I'm feeling like maybe the business is going to go through a really bad period. And he's like, correction, the record business may go through some rough times, but the live business is thriving. And then that's when I was like, you guys need a lawyer. But I'd never, ever thought I'd go in-house at any point. By the time I sat down with him, my practice was doing so well. And I had built it for so many years that I was finally feeling like this is working. And then once he said live side, I was like, this is maybe one of those times when you take a chance and do something different. So you became in-house counsel at the agency group. I started to represent the agency group as one of my clients. So I moved into their offices, physically moved into their offices. At the time, they were at 1775 Broadway, 57th and Broadway. And I kept representing clients outside of the agency group as well. But shortly after I started working from their office, 
this as it became apparent that they needed more and more and more legal work to be done. So it didn't happen right away. But by 2009, I was really general counsel there. Steve Martin is one of those guys that can just take your career and spin it into a completely different direction that you had no idea you ever wanted to go into. And then three years later, you're just like, oh, look at what happened. He can do that. And he has done that for many artists and agents and managers. Steve has that way of seeing something in people and transforming. And clearly that was a big moment for you. No doubt. He's a friend. He's a colleague. He's a mentor. And without him, my path would have been quite different. Okay. So between the time that you took them on as a client and actually became in-house counsel and lost the rest of your other clients, because you focus on just that one client when you're in-house, right? To focus entirely on the agency group, I ultimately became an employee there in 2013. And that was a very interesting period because even though I'd been representing the company since 2005, I wasn't actively employed and fully employed there until 2013. And 2013 was an interesting year because it was the year that Neil Warnock brought on Gavin O'Reilly to lead the company worldwide as the worldwide CEO. The newspaper dude. Correct. And it was also the year that, unfortunately, Steve Martin left the agency group. So it's quite a volatile year and a very different set of circumstances from when Steve was leading the company in North America to when Gavin took over and was leading worldwide. And I think Gavin saw that with Steve's departure, he needed somebody in the U.S. that can help him lead the company because he was based in our U.K. office. And so he and I sat down and he said, would you consider it, would you consider leading the U.S. company? And it took me longer than that one meeting to decide, but it's a company that I love. It's people that I love. Those people are my family. You know, we spend more time with our colleagues in most cases than we do with our family just because of the hours that we work. And it's the business that I love. And I think I can get along with him, with Gavin. And so it took me a little while to digest this. And then I felt like this was an opportunity for me to help lead the company into its next chapter. Didn't know what that chapter was going to be yet, but it became quite apparent what the chapter was going to be once I got there. The company lost in Steve, the dad. Steve was without question the guy that had his hands on everyone's career. And he traveled around to all of the offices, at least in North America. So they needed guiding direction and force. And they turned to you to be able to do that. Well, it was a shakeup for sure. I don't know that they really turned to me, but it was sort of on me to figure out what we were going to do in Steve's absence. And as a company going forward, how are we going to evolve? Well, there's only so much Neil can do himself from the UK. And clearly Gavin being in the UK, only so much he can do. And so many employees, all of them entrepreneurs, all of them overseeing their own rosters as the agency group worked, particularly on you kill what you eat, you book what you do. Everybody focused on themselves and not so much a lot of unity because there wasn't a touring system where everybody knows what everybody else is doing. A lot of disconnects. So having that bridge of someone knowing where the synergy is of, oh, you're doing this. Well, do you know he's doing that too? They needed that hub. And yes, definitely that, definitely the teamwork aspect, but even more so than that, you know, the agency group has historically been a great music booking agency and the agents there are excellent and historically have been excellent. And there's always a system of bringing in real talent even though some of that agent talent may have come on without a roster, right? But one of the senior guys, whether it was Neil or Steve or Ralph or Andy or Bruce, they saw something in someone and they brought that person on knowing that they would be a pivotal part of the agency as the agency developed. So there's always this feeling of mentoring, of professionalism, of expertise. But when I came on, what was important to me is that the landscape had changed so much in terms of what artists and managers managers were looking for from agencies. And because of the shift in how record royalties were being paid out or being paid out less and artists taking to the road, what I started to see was that we had gaps in our business that needed to be filled. For example, I couldn't have implemented full service at the agency, but there were some areas that our artists were looking for. Just because you guys didn't have film and TV. Right. Film and TV is not something you can build overnight. You know, certainly not at a professional, robust level, right? You need 
time to do that. Or a really nice merger. Or eventually when you realize that you can't build those divisions overnight, that you definitely look at the landscape and see if there's a partner, which is ultimately in 2015 what happened with the agency group. But prior to that, leading into that, I was looking at our business and seeing the areas where we could bring in divisions that can help facilitate some of the things that our artists want to do. So brand synergy, for example, you know, brand partnerships, we were able to cover some of those bases. Obviously in Mark Gerald, we had a book agent that had been with us prior to me starting to lead the company. He had been with us for years and he's a prolific book agent and one of the visionaries of that area of that space. And then also specialty divisions like Seth Sholmes and Casinos and the college agents that we had at the time, which, you know, we now use as sort of like the training ground for our agents is the college booking space. But that was never a dedicated division at the agency group. So things like that, we started doing private corporates. We brought in an agent to lead that practice. Obviously, now we have Craig Janice leading that practice, which is a game changer for us. Yeah, kind um, of the gold standard in that world. Huge. I mean, an extraordinary human being and an extraordinary professional. So really thrilled to have him. We had a speakers division at the time that we brought in. So there were things that we were doing to help service our clients, but it it never felt like it was enough. As a lawyer, you deal with problems or preventing problems in contract law. But in your role in UTA and at the agency group, you're very hands-on with the interactions and the workings of the client relationship with the agents and how that relationship works, keeping everything smooth and keeping everybody happy. I mean, Jason Flom is a client of yours. He was just happened to be on the podcast a second before you were here and to see the interaction. You know what the clients are doing that you guys work with. That's far stretch from what a lawyer would normally pay attention to when they're working on getting the contract law correct. And that really started with my responsibility or expander responsibility at the agency group because the strategic part of artist representation and the strategic part of our business is really what appeals to me and has always appealed to me. Even as an artist attorney, I was never just so super transactional that I can rest on just doing artist deals. So I would look at my client and, you know, almost do all three things, be an agent, be a lawyer and a manager for that client. Because in most cases, they needed that level of support. Most of my clients were developing artists. You know, I unfortunately didn't have the arena sell out. Well, everybody starts and, somewhere. Right. And so as part of that practice, I had to be able to service my clients in all different areas. And in many cases, it meant doing their live shows and selling their services to promoters. And, you know, in many cases, it meant helping them figure out what their support supposed to do at this particular place in time, their single is popping or the album just dropped and is doing really well. How do we capitalize on that? So I was able to bring that mentality to the agency group. And then now subsequently being able to connect those dots within UTA has been really exciting. The merger news or the acquisition news is one day in the conscience of the industry. But for somebody like me, who's like a special ops person at the company, that's two plus years of work. The interesting thing about UTA and the agency group is it was two parts of an agency that needed each other. And there's not a ton of agencies in the industry that were big enough to have those pieces that needed. UTA is great on the film and branding side, but their live touring side was really not that great. Their comedy division was very well built at that moment, but they were still missing that. Their touring side, j was there. And before that, they had a couple of the other big agents that wound up leaving right after. But they existed, but it was a very small. It was almost an independent live touring agency on that side. It was very small. But with you guys in one shot, became a major touring agency, but then you became full service all the way around by putting those two pieces together. It was kind of a match made in heaven. For sure. I always describe it as the stars aligning because everything that UTA does, and at the time, if you remember back to 2015, UTA was in the news all the time because there were all sorts of progressive things, acquisitions, agent migrations that were happening where UTA was at the epicenter of that. So UTA excels in pretty much everything that they do because there's nothing haphazard there. There's a lot of strategy. There's a lot of planning. And so 
so they had a music division. It was a smaller footprint than obviously the one that we brought in with the acquisition. So looking at the landscape at the time, I wasn't sitting in the boardroom, but I imagine that the board of directors looked at the landscape and said, you know, if we're going to build a music division, let it be a global footprint, let it be strong, let it be made up of a number of professionals in different disciplines and different genres. And, oh, this agency group looks like it would be the perfect fit. I feel like if I were an executive looking at the landscape, then our company, the agency group, would have been a really attractive target. You guys are playing on every level as a major agency. You guys are a top six agency all the way around. Yeah, absolutely. And like I was referencing before, you know, it's the connecting the dots. It's the music agents getting to know the film and TV agents and the digital agents and the brand synergy agents. And it's how do you connect the dots over which clients, what deals make the most sense? And how do you establish communication when in some cases you're 3000 miles away from one another? Now I might have a music agent in New York that just joined our team, for example, shortly after the acquisition and comes to me and says, Natalia, I have this artist, this artist, this artist, I need this area, this area, this area for support. And so being able to connect those dots and being able to bring people together and ultimately yield successful businesses or business transactions was and continues to be super exciting because we do a lot of that. You're running one of the biggest agencies in the world. You don't just get to do that. And clearly building that law practice doesn't just happen. You got to go to law school and then you have to have all the contacts in the world. Where did it start? How did that all come together? My family immigrated to the U.S. from the Soviet Union in 1979. I was always a fan of music. And in the Soviet Union, you couldn't just go to concerts. Like you couldn't stand in line for a ticket, buy a ticket, go to a show. You had to know someone who knew someone. And even then there was no guarantee you were getting in. And so family gatherings and gatherings among friends became the places where people expressed themselves. And someone had a guitar, someone could sing, and someone brought some food and families and friends would get together and they would play music and kids were always there. It was like a picnic in people's homes, but a little bit on the DL because you didn't want the neighbors to get too excited about what was going on next door. So rigid entertainment structure in that Males, when they took the stage, men in tuxedos rendered their performances and to lukewarm applause, women in long gowns, lukewarm applause, everyone went home. And so that was my perception of the entertainment space. And so when I came to America and I saw color television for the first time in 1979, and on it was a man singing with bleach blonde hair, black roots, spandex pants and a shirt unbuttoned up to his belly button. And he was holding on to fishnet clad legs in the video. And it was Rod Stewart. I couldn't (laughs) believe my eyes because I couldn't believe the freedom of expression, the melody, the lyrics, the guitar riffs. It was just all so Western and it was all so American that at that very moment, I felt like that's the world that I want to be in. And that's the world that I want to exist in, not really knowing anything about how to get into that world to begin with. And so I sort of kept that, filed that in the back of my head. My parents set me on a lawyer track because they said to me, Americans say to make money, you have to either be a doctor or a lawyer. You, Natalia, don't like the sight of blood. So you're not going to be a doctor. You're going to have to be a lawyer. And so they set me up on that track. And when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, while I was in college, my parents called me up and they were like, oh, and by the way, now you should be an international lawyer, not really knowing what international law would ultimately mean. So I applied to a couple of schools in DC, which had exchange programs with Eastern European law schools, because I thought it could be cool to be an exchange student while I was studying. And Just to make law school that much harder, student of foreign language. <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to experience once I got to law school. So I was accepted at Columbus Law, which is a tiny little school in Washington, DC. And I started working right Right away at an international trade firm because I was paying my own way through school and I had to get a job right away. So there I am in DC. I'd never been there, certainly never lived there before. When you came over, immigrated to the US, did you already know English? No, no. I was eight years old when we came over. And so, in a foreign country, not knowing language. Not knowing the language. And, you know, the stories about coming up in the United States during the Cold War, I'll save for another time. But I will tell you that like, my family had no money. We had zero money. And my 
mom would leave us a dollar on Fridays for a slice of pizza and, and a soda for me and my brother. So I would buy my brother his slice of pizza and his soda, but I would save my money so I can buy records because I love music so much. And then I would bring the records home and I would translate each and every lyric and each and every liner note with my little English to Russian dictionary so I could understand what the lyrics meant. And then I would play the records over and over and over again so I could mimic the words and speak English without an accent. Because when you have an accent and it's the Cold War and you're a Russian kid, you're basically labeled a communist and nobody wants to be your friend. So I learned how to speak English through music, through translating the album sleeves. And my vocabulary was limited as a result. It was a lot of love songs and heartbreak, but still, you know, it was enough to get by and to understand how to make sentences and define the words. So anyway, that's how I learned English, basically, is through that. How long did it take you to pick up? Well, I was young and you absorb much quicker then. So I would say probably about two years to speak without an accent and have a decent vocabulary. That's amazing. Although I imagine sitting in front of the TV when you get home probably actually benefited. Oh, no doubt. General Hospital was like my thing. (laughs) (laughs) General Hospital and Good Times and, you know, whatever else they were putting on TV in Queens, New York at the time. You learned uh, English by watching J.J. Walker say dynamite. (laughs) Awesome. Basically. So anyway, back to the law school thing. So there I am in Washington. I'm in law school. I'm working in an international trade firm. I was assigned to a partner that co-wrote the rules of origin section of the North American Free Trade Agreement. So it's like the furthest thing from fun that you can imagine doing. And I felt myself just stifled and really unhappy. I didn't like any part of my existence at the time. And so on complaining to one of, and my parents were like, you have to finish school. You can't come home because I tried to pitch them on coming home early. And they were like, no. So in complaining about my existence to a friend of mine in school, he says to me, why don't you do something in music? And I was like, what what do you mean? I don't know how to sing or write or do anything creative. And he said, well, you can be a lawyer in the music business. He goes, in fact, I have an internship at the RIAA, which I'm going to give up shortly because my passion is film and I'm interviewing at the MPAA. And so once I vacate my spot, at the very least, I can get you an interview there. And that's what happened. So thanks to him, I got an interview there. When I walked into the RIAA, I said, if I have to answer phones here for the rest of my life, I'm never leaving. Because it was really like the doors of Nirvana had just opened up for me and I felt at home and I felt like I'd found my place. How long did you last there before you wound up starting your own firm? Well, it was about a year and a half until I finished law school. Then I came back to New York to take the bar and I had no job because I didn't interview in school. I thought, you know, how hard would it be to find work when I came out of law school? It was really, really, really hard to get a job. And so I took the bar, took some time off because I was exhausted from studying and and school. So when you took the bar, did you ever imagine that managing Ken for Megalish's career was going to be what would lead to that? (laughs) I don't pretend to manage anyone's careers. I just try to facilitate things for anyone willing to take There's me up There's a fucking on. lawyer answer if I ever heard one. <laughs> so I couldn't get a job when I started to interview. And after three rejections, I knew I didn't want to get another rejection. So I was talking to my mom and my then boyfriend, and they were both like, just open your own firm. And I was like, but I don't know anything. And they're like, well, how hard can it be? <laughs> And it was hard. It was real hard. Yeah, I took an office space at 250 West 57th Street in the Fisk Building, which West 57th Street was the then mecca of the entertainment industry in New York. And I just put my name on the door, but no clients came, right? Because nobody knew I was there. And slowly, I built myself out as a music lawyer because, of course, that's what I was in my head, but I hadn't done a transaction yet. (laughs) And so I would put ads in the Russian paper, for example, like if you want your copyright registered or if you need a trademark registered, come to me or you need a visa to come tour in the United States. I would do everything. I would learn as I went along. And and then I would put ads in the Village Voice about uh, if you want your demo shop to the international music community 
community and I would take people's demos and shop them at Popcom and ADE and meet them and get license deals for compilations and things like that. So little by little, you learned by doing. I learned by doing. And now when people ask me who my mentors were early on, my mentors were my adversaries because it was always the lawyers on the other side. When I was negotiating transactions with them, I would write shit down that they would say, because I'm like, one day I'm going to be on the other side of the transaction. And if, you know, so-and-so is using this against me now, I'm going to use it against somebody else down the line. So, so that's really how I learned. I was like self-taught through and through, but I always say when I speak at schools, don't do what I did because it worked for me and I don't regret any step, but you potentially expose yourself to a ton of liability by doing what I did. So does your uh, Russian ancestry with your language help you in business at all? Does it come up? Do you call on that much? At this point, very, very little. Um, when I was an artist representative, I did represent a few artists from Russia. And also I represented a bunch of distributors, content distributors. So I would travel all sorts of festivals, music festivals and film festivals, getting content for distribution, DVD, theatrical, television and music, because my clients were the distributors in various territories, Ukraine, Russia, Kazakhstan. And I also represented nightclubs in Moscow, and help to sell talent to them. Can I ask you, would, would you translate promoter 101 into Russian? It's the same. Is they it? use that Promoter's word. the same word? They use the word promoter now, yeah. Fuck me. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking time. Amazed by your career and what you've accomplished. Coming as an immigrant and now running one of the biggest agencies, music departments is amazing. It's a dream come true. And I say this every day when kids in the hall stop me and ask me how I'm doing. I always say I'm living the dream and it's the truth. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Natalia is just an amazing example of what can be done if you're truly driven in this world. Inspiring. Hey, Jim Cressman, Invictus Entertainment Group, and you're listening to Steiny on Promoter 101. Remember, you can always send us an email. We want to hear from you. Shoot us a note to Steiny at Promoter101.net. The quote of the week comes to us from John Lennon. Life is what happens when you are busy making plans. And we're going to be back for episode 78 of Promoter 101 next week with Australia's biggest concert promoter, Michael Chug. We're also going to have Red Light's Eric Mayers, Soda Jerk Presents, Mike Barsh, and Moo Creative, Scott Scoble, turning the tables on us. I want to thank you all for listening, and we're wishing you sold-out shows for the weeks to come. Cheers. Cheers. This is Whitney Bond from Triple Eight Management, reminding you to keep your mazel strong, appearing live on Promoter 101.